everybody. Um, I apologize for my hat hair. I've uh, been wearing a baseball cap all day, so I look very disheveled. Um, so we are going to be finishing our very brief unit on the Red Scare and its connections to the Salem Witch Trials and our reading of the play The Crucible. And I wanted to end this unit with a little uh, lecture on propaganda, society, and the individual. Before we start today, you'll probably notice there are more grades trickling in. Um, term one has officially ended and I'll be submitting grades on Tuesday. So uh, if you have not turned in any late assignments for me to grade, please go ahead and do that, okay? So I can get those in, um, bump your grade up a little bit. So let's start the lecture. All right, propaganda, society, and the individual. So what is propaganda? Well, propaganda is information. It is information that is usually uh, biased or misleading in nature. And propaganda is used to promote or publicize a particular political cause, point of view, or we'll later find out that um, propaganda is marketing, it's commercials, it's ads on the internet. Um, it, it, it is not limited to just political campaigns um, or war or politics. Um, also important to note that propaganda um, is, um, well, not technically always bad, right? Um, I'm sure lots of us have seen propaganda for causes that we think are, are just and good, but you have to know that propaganda um, is biased, okay? When people make propaganda, um, they are generally making it to promote or publicize a very specific thing and their own specific point of view. Um, there is a goal in propaganda. It's, it's not uh, made to get you thinking about both sides. It is pushing you towards one side in particular. Okay, so these are the main types of propaganda that you probably see most of these on a daily basis, um, being on the internet, watching TV. In this current moment, driving down the road, billboards, bumper stickers, uh, radio ads. And I wanted to start with um, a tactic of propaganda called transfer. And transfer propaganda is the act of relating something or someone we like or respect or dislike and fear with an event, product, party, movement, etc. Symbols are constantly used in this form. Um, a big one that, that people have used uh, since World War II is sort of associating a political figure with Nazism. Oh, they're a Nazi. Um, this sort of act of putting that symbol onto a political candidate or a political ideology um, to kind of demonize it. Uh, Propagandists usually um, will also use this to associate certain candidates with communism or socialism, especially from the right. And the left will kind of like lob back accusations of the other side being um, fascists or Nazis. Um, and, you know, uh, in certain cases, this might be true on, on one side or the other. Um, but it's that transfer, that act of transferring this symbol onto a political candidate. Um, and that is a big one, and we're gonna see a lot of that um, in the upcoming election. But let's dive into the other ones. The second one, one that you probably see um, quite often is bandwagon. Everybody's doing it, follow the crowd. Propagandists want to create a false sense of mass support or maybe hatred 
for a specific movement or candidate, or sometimes a product. This type of language and emotion plays on this natural human desire to be on the winning side. Um, we all want to win. We don't. Uh, we we don't want to find ourselves um, on the short end of the stick. We want to win, um, and propagandists utilize that that innate desire in us to win. Um, this one right here, this uh, I guess was from a, a, a an ad when Hillary Clinton was running for president. Fifty seven percent of the United States population says that, yes, they would vote for Hillary Clinton. 57% is quite a lot. This sort of bandwagon propaganda would have you think, oh, well, most people are doing it. I should do it too. Um, bandwagon propaganda is very successful. Um, in terms of like marketing or products outside of a political sense, it's like, well, everybody's got an iPhone. Don't you want an iPhone? Do you want to be the the one guy that that <laughs> is carrying around a flip phone or an Android? Why don't you have an iPhone, right? It's this fit in mentality that bandwagon propaganda um, utilizes. Second one, like I said earlier, as November gets closer and closer, um, we're going to see a lot of name calling between political candidates. Propaganda creators use this tactic to sow negative or sometimes even violent reactions and opinions about a person or group of individuals. And like I said, we see this mostly in political elections. Con man, snob, monster, fascist, communist, um, flip-flopper. Um, it kind of, these sort of names... Um, sum up attacks, right? It's easy to just uh, blurt out these terms about a political candidate without m even knowing much about them. Um, it kind of attaches a, a, a negative reaction to these like short little phrases that um, can mean a lot and can excuse a lot of people from doing research or thinking critically about something, someone, or a group of people. Here's another really effective one, plain folks or the common man. Um, propagandists use this strategy to sort of evoke or create familiarity or a common connection between audience or speaker because people trust the average guy, the average Joe, the next door neighbor, someone who can empathize with them, understand them and say, look, I'm just like you. Um, the uh, Republican Party uses this in a very specific way a lot of times. Um, the left kind of uses it in a different way. We'll talk about that. But I chose these three images because um, I think it really, really, really highlights that plain folks or common man um, propaganda. Over here is uh, Ronald Reagan. He's, you know, a rough and rugged man. He's on his ranch. He's splitting wood. He's just like you. He's just like your dad, right? He works hard. In the middle here um, was a Republican candidate named Barry Goldwater. Um, he sort of was uh, a common man, sort of a plain folks type of guy. He was a hunter, a great outdoorsman, lived on a ranch, you know, worked hard, was rugged, and um, a lot of people really identified with that. On the left, there's John McCain, you know, wearing his, his button down and his baseball cap uh, overlooking the desert in Arizona. Um, people sympathize with this type of imagery. Famously, uh, George W. Bush, who had never uh, owned a ranch or worked on a ranch, his campaign thought it would be a, a good idea for him to buy a ranch in Texas 
to make the American people sort of feel like he was this working class man. He was um, working out on his ranch, right? He, he was like you because he worked hard day in and day out. Um, and in reality, guys like Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush were just wealthy politicians. Um, but they sort of curated this image of themselves being working class heroes that uh, won over a, a lot of people. Um, uh, Democrat Democratic candidates are, are also guilty of this. They want you to feel like they're working class. They made their way through the ranks. They worked hard to get where they are. They're just like you. They're common. And uh, it works on the other side just as well. Glittering generalities, another huge propaganda tactic. Um, glittering generalities are emotionally appealing phrases or images that usually don't mean anything, really. Um, they lack reason. They lack logic. They're made up for by sentimentality and, and good vibes, good feelings. Political slogans of any kind are great examples of this type of propaganda. Um, to the left here, we have um, these political buttons. I make the difference. We're all in this together. It's in our hands. Vote for yourself. Your vote worked. <laughs> Give a damn. Um, these phrases really don't tell us anything about the, the political candidate's uh, platform, what they stand for, but these phrases sound good. Um, Reagan and Bush in 80, let's make America great again. Um, Donald Trump used this again in 2016 continues to use it, and it's very effective. Make America great again. doesn't really tell us much about Trump's campaign policies or what he plans to do to make America great again, but it's a great slogan. Regardless of where you sit on the, the political aisle, it's pretty effective. Here's another um, really effective one. Uh, Barack Obama's one-word glittering, glittering generality, which was hope. Um that's such a, a, a powerful image and message, but it doesn't really say anything about what Obama was planning to do to instill this hope in us, right? Um, didn't tell us anything about his specific plans. And that's what glittering generalities do. They kind of overlook the, um, the details, and they kind of present us with this um, glittering image of this political candidate. John F. Kennedy, Kennedy for President, a time for greatness. These are really powerful phrases. Don't mean much, but they sound cool. <laughs> okay, ad nauseum. In the 21st century, this is one that we experience a lot. If you have a smartphone, if you get on the internet, if you watch TV, um, you have fallen prey to a tactic called ad nauseum. And that's a Latin term that can be defined as something that has been done or repeated so many times in so many spaces that it has become tiresome, robotic, or annoying. Uh, TV and internet commercials and ads utilize this tactic. It's that constant bombardment of information, language, and images. And once you see these things over and over and over and over again, it rewires your brain to maybe think, oh, these opinions are good. These products work. These political slogans are good and they're true. Um, it's funny what happens to the brain when it is, you know, attacked over and over and over again. Um, it's interesting uh, if you have studied psychology. Um, in any way, you're probably familiar with the name Sigmund Freud, who was a very, very well-known uh, thinker in the field of psychology and psychiatrics. And his nephew, funny enough, um, in the 50s, 40s and 50s, 
kind of developed this tactic of ad nauseum. He, learning under his uncle, kind of studied the human brain and how it reacts to the, the bombardment of images and phrases. And he found out that it creates different pathways in your brain that eventually you hear the thing so many times that you start to believe it. Um, and this tactic of ad nauseum is probably at its height in 2020. Okay, the next one, demonizing the enemy. We see this one a lot in times of um, uh, upheaval in a country, in times of war, and in political campaigns. So by making the enemy side the other, or truly evil, or inhuman, lacking in any human characteristics, the propaganda creator can turn the audience on the opposing side. Um, by making your opponent or your enemy look devilish, demonic, lacking in those human characteristics, emotionally you start to root for the side that the propagandist is um, hoping, hoping that you join. Um, Here's some great ones. Um, this image of this mean looking Japanese soldier, right? It's about ready to take you out in this propaganda poster from World War II. Stop him and the job's done. Stop the monster and the job's done. Um, below that is a um, Russian uh, anti-Jewish um, piece of propaganda that the Nazis used um, obviously quite a bit to the German people to kind of create a scapegoat out of the Jews. These quote-unquote monstrous Jews that have ruined our society and ruined this nation. They're the reason we lost World War I. Um, you can sort of by, by removing their human characteristics, you can turn an entire population on them. And that's exactly what Nazi propaganda did. It made them look like the demons, the devil, in their story. And propaganda like this that portrayed the Jews as, as evil really helped convince a lot of Germans that um, they were the true enemy. This one up here, I don't know if it's from World War One or World War Two, but destroy this mad brute in list. I think it's from World War One, judging by the helmet. But um, this was a English propaganda poster getting men to um, join up the British mil in the British military to fight against the German threat. Um, see, he's he's taking the damsel in distress. Um, He's menacing. He's evil. He's an animal. Um, uh, in this case, uh, some of this, a lot of this anti, or this um, World War II propaganda, I think um, that was propaganda, um, was I think everyone can agree a, a good thing um, until it sort of morphed into this racist caricature of like uh, the Japanese. Um, and not to defend the Japanese from World War II, but um, some of this World War II propaganda, particularly particularly against the Germans, um, I think was effective because the Germans were heartless, uh, genocidal killing machines. Um, Here's one below, soldiers eat babies. That's a, a, a common uh, since the beginning of time, accusing the opposite side of their soldiers uh, eating babies or killing babies. Um, lastly, I think this one, this is a two-parter. Um, and we'll start with the first one, appeal to fear, that kind of goes along with the demonization of the enemy. But an appeal to fear is using the 
manipulating the human nature of fear and terror to kind of spur people into um, action. Um, here we see um, this is not political or marketing. It's a religious piece of propaganda. Turn to Jesus or burn in hell. So they're kind of twisting that fear of eternal damnation and saying, follow Jesus and you can miss out on this eternity of, of pain and sorrow. Um, but uh, to kind of tie it into like the Red Scare, I, I know I've shown you all this one. Is this tomorrow? America under communism. Basically this appeal to, well, if the communists take over the world, it's going to be set on fire. Um, buy war bonds and stamps so that we don't uh, have to breathe in poison gas. Um, this one famously from World War II, loose, li loose lips might sink ships. Don't talk about where the uh, supply boats are going. The Nazis might hear and they might uh, sink these ships. Um, yeah, so appeal to fear is such a powerful emotion. That manipulation of, of terror uh, really works. Um, this next one kind of goes hand in hand, nationalism. This sort of extreme, extreme devotion to a country to the point where you have tunnel vision, right? You no longer believe in the sanctity of human life as long as your nation or your the group that you identify with uh, succeeds. Um, we see this a lot, again, in times of war and in political campaigns, and it's like... Um, Again, this manipulation, like, are you a true American? Are you a true um, believer in liberty and freedom and the American way? Um, if not, well, I guess you're a commie, <laughs> according to this propaganda. Um, and this, like, nationalism, this, like, fervent belief in country, regardless of the evils that your country has done, we see this a lot in German propaganda. Um, here's a um, piece of Nazi propaganda from World War II um, urging men to sign up for the German military. Be like the brave soldier on the front line. Die for your country. This is really effective propaganda. Um, so that's... Those are the big ones. Um, there's other, you know, subgenres within all of these, but I wanted to sort of go over the um, big, big examples of propaganda. Um, here's another great piece of uh, Nazi propaganda that um, sort of uses nationalism. Um, bandwagon, glittering generalities, just common folks, I think is probably the biggest one. It's like in Nazi propaganda, this was the ideal image of a German family. Like, don't you want to be like them? Don't you want to be on a beach somewhere with your perfect blonde hair and blue eyes? Um, yeah. Um, Look over the rest of these, clearly, marketing. Marketing is possibly the ultimate propaganda. Um, but stopping there, um, hopefully hopefully this, this lecture has sort of um, helped you identify pieces of propaganda um, that you encounter in your daily life. Um, might help you kind of shine a flashlight into the sort of psychology that they're using, um, the sort of tactics that corporations and um, governments and political campaigns use to twist your vote, maybe get you to buy that 
that new flavor of Mountain Dew, right? Um, that is it for today. Remember, guys, if you haven't, please turn in those assignments so I can put grades in, okay? Um, that is it for today. There will be an assignment with this lecture up on Google Classroom. And as always, let me know if you have any questions. Bye, y'all.